Welcome to the DNA Talks podcast, where we take on the mission of unlocking the code of your genetics. This season is all about you, upgrading your health, not just on the surface, but down to the root cause. Join us as your clinicians at the DNA company investigate your DNA and beyond. The intention of this podcast is to enhance your lifestyle by changing what is in your control. This does not substitute the medical advice given by your personal doctor, therapist, and other healthcare professionals. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I have the privilege and pleasure of stepping in with the most magnanimous Dr. Lara to support this evening's most delightful conversation around the genetics of longevity and hopefully demystifying that because I think personally when I heard the title I was like oh goodness this is going to be a long thesis of a night but um as Dr. Lara and I chatted and prepared for this session I think she in particular but we both have some really strong insights to offer that hopefully can take such a very daunting thing like longevity and genetics and all the glorious little parts and pieces that go into it and humanize it a little bit for you. My name is Dr. Krista. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I'm the chief scientific officer here at the DNA company. Um, I'm going to allow Dr. Lara in just one moment to introduce herself. I just want to orient us a little bit to today's time. So we'll be together discussing all things longevity, hopefully offering you with some very tangible takeaways as to if my goal is to be living longer and better, right? Really emphasis on that quality of life piece. You know, here are things that maybe I could take away from the session. That's the goal that we have put out for us today. So Dr. Laura, welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, hello and glorious day to everyone. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to spend it with us to continue to learn on your health journey. And really, that is what we are here to do tonight, is uh, continuing to uh, expound the information and to uh, navigate and and play with all of this wonderful technologies and Mm. the DNA and all of the lovely things that life has to offer, right down to the basicness of breathing. So, (laughs) so very important and things that sometimes we take for granted and uh, just realizing the importance of the simple things in life. uh, We should never overlook that because really when we talk about quality of life, quality of aging, it really comes down to the simple things. So my name is Dr. Laura Varden. I am a holistic health practitioner and functional genomics practitioner and in-house clinician with the DNA company here to help you on your journey in learning your DNA and how you can use that to leverage the information and personalize your health journey. So thank you all for being here. So Laura, how let's let's kick things off here and let's really talk about how one goes about demystifying this really big concept of aging. In particular, when we think about aging, there's so many different dimensions to it, right? Health concerns, memory concerns, mobility concerns, right? Let's let's jump right into it all. And and I don't know if you have um kind of a place that you like to start off with but whenever i have conversations with clients or patients around aging i always ask the question of what are you going to spend your health on like why are you bothering to be healthy right how how do your conversations go with your clients i often encourage them to really crystallize what their why is i mean what what is it Mm-hmm. What is making you do the things that you are doing? What is making you, uh, you know, what made you purchase the package to learn this stuff with the DNA? Mm-hmm. Because when you know what that motivation is, that is what continues to motivate you. <laughs> is what, I mean, a lot of us know, you know, the basics of good health. You know, let's eat clean, drink good, clean water, get good sleep. And that's wonderful, but that's a very broad, nebulous, sometimes type of a a goal. And it's like, well, how do I go about doing that? 
And mm-hmm. when we start digging in and going, okay, well, looking at your genes, looking at your environment, looking at you and your past traumas and all of this other stuff. So now there's work to be done and mm-hmm. having those, the recommendations that I give and, and doing, putting in the hard work, it's going, okay, all right, you know, turning off my Wi-Fi at night or, mm-hmm. or, you know, putting down my phone and, you know, not looking at screens for a while to get better sleep yeah. and, you know, to make sure that they follow through with that, mm-hmm. they have to be motivated. They have yeah. to go and keep that forefront yeah. what their goal is. That is so yeah. very important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that that really stuck out to me. I, I once worked with a, a client and he was a personal trainer. He was in spectacular shape. And I said, what motivates you? Like, how do you keep at the gym? Because he was he he had ventured onto to academia. So he was no longer in that space. And his comment to me, he's like, well, I think about myself at 90 years old and at 90, I want to be playing with my grandchildren. So every time I don't want to go to the gym, I think about, well, if I want to play with my grandchildren, I need to have mobility and strength and therefore that gets me to the gym. And I I thought that was such a beautiful thing because this person at that point in time was not partnered. They didn't have children, you know, they didn't even, they weren't close to that grandchildren, but it was still those, that idea, that purpose that brought them every day to the gym and, and quite spectacular shape and all the other fun things, right? They, they educated me more in those sessions than I think I did them. Yeah. I love that though. The crystallizing of the why and keeping that forefront. So another question for you, and perhaps I know you're so talented. I know this per se isn't going to be putting you on the spot, but I I hope you can articulate kind of the reasoning behind it. A lot of people will come to me and say like, hey, so you have all my genes. Tell me the one gene that tells me I'm going to live forever or not live forever. (laughs) You know, maybe can you speak to the idea that there's not really one singular gene and how we go about looking at genetic data to inform about what we can know about longevity from genetic data and what we can't know. Because I think the can't know is there and people don't like that, but it is still there. <laughs> right. And I see that's the thing. We we are in a society of that quick fix, mm-hmm. a pill for an ill, just give me something to make me better. Yeah. You know, or to make me live forever or just to, you're right, that that one thing. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, it's never just one thing. Yeah. And, you know, we we are here on this earth to have so many experiences. And there's just so many aspects to living. Why would you want to distill it down to just one thing? <laughs> that the importance of genetics, when you consider our DNA and how big it is and how complex simplistically complex you know this this dichotomy of the the complexity of our bodies but yet doing simple things yeah. can make it work so beautifully yeah so talk about the genes if you had to boil it down to so we all appreciate it's not one gene mm-hmm. but if you had to boil it down to let's just say your top two or three what do you think your top two or three would be and why don't we talk about those for a little bit Okay, Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, pick top ones uh, that really work with the major concerns of of our group here. I love that. So we were talking about one of the major concerns of aging is memory decline, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, things like that. And one of the major genes that's associated with that is the ApoE gene. Mm-hmm. Uh, there has been a lot of research that has associated that particular gene mm-hmm. with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. I will dive into that in a little bit, but I want to pick out some of the others. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say another major one would be the TCF7L2 gene. Oof. <laughs> simply because when we are talking about cardiovascular health uh, diabetes because really alzheimer's is tightly associated with diabetes many say it is actually type 3 diabetes mm-hmm. so looking at the uh, tcf7l uh, 
2 gene, this working with insulin. So, and your insulin response and any type of uh, increased or decreased risk in getting type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. I would say... One more, and then I'll add one to the pot. And I don't think, I'm going to remind the audience, like this is not an all-inclusive list. I think it's more just uh, uh, us arbitrarily picking some of our, some of the genes when we're meeting with someone, maybe just for an hour, what we would tend to focus on if the concern is purely longevity. Yeah. I think my, my other one would actually have to be a detox pathway. Mm. Specifically like the glutathione conjugation pathway, your mm-hmm. GST genes, because I think it very important for your body to be able to detoxify efficiently and effectively in order to continue for your cells to be healthy, for the mitochondria to be working for you to remove those toxins because onboard toxins, if you're not able to get rid of those and they keep reabsorbing, they can damage your Mm -hmm. DNA. They can damage the cell. They can damage the tissue. And then it's kind of like everything's out the door. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. so I would say I'll I'll pick those. (laughs) I would love to hear what you'd like to add to that list. I think I think the only other one I would add, because I, I think your list is pretty extensive, and I think we should offer a little bit of conversation around each of those, what how you kind of interpret them, what implications they have to help. I think the only other two I would add to this list, firstly, would be uh, 9P21, 9P21, because cardiovascular issues, we know, especially within North America, are amongst the leading causes of death not exclusively, but they are amongst those. And so I think speaking to a gene that we've so tightly tied to cardiovascular outcomes, namely heart attack, stroke, kind of those less savory guys that everyone hears about, I think we should spend a little time on that. And then I think separately, a lot of people, at least within the news media, talk about FOXO3, right? Everyone talks about FOXO3 as this panacea of like, oh, if you have it, you're going to live forever. If not, good luck. And I, I wonder maybe, you know, at the tail end of our conversation, if we can maybe demystify that a little bit, speak to the truth of what it can offer, the good of it, and then also its limitations, because I think boiling longevity down to simply that one gene or simply that one SNP isn't entirely fair. I think that's where I'd like to go with this conversation. Dr. Laura and I are now going to jump into some of these genes. Why don't we start with the delight of of APOE. So what are you looking for and why are you looking at APOE, uh, Dr. Lara, when you see people? Okay, so getting to APOE. Now, APOE is a gene, actually it creates a protein that works with an LDL cholesterol. It is an LDL cholesterol, uh, a transport gene. So now I'm sure a lot of you go, oh, I I know LDL and yeah, my numbers are too high and everything else. But Mm -hmm. what exactly is that? Well, LDL is a low density lipoprotein. And what does it do? What What it does is it acts like a taxi in the body because cholesterol cannot move around the bloodstream and in the body all by itself. It needs to have a taxi. Well, that's what LDLs are. This is what HDLs are. They are the taxis. So with LDL cholesterol, this is what the what happens is when your cardiovascular system, the endothelial lining gets uh, uh, inflamed due to toxins that are present. Well, what happens is cholesterol is used as an inflammation management tool. It's like Vaseline, that protection to cover that microabrasion on the cardiovascular lining. Well, like I said, cholesterol can't move around the bloodstream by itself. So LDL, it's like, okay, taxi, come pick me up. LDL goes down to the liver, picks up the cholesterol, brings it to the site of inflammation, slathers on that cholesterol. So that way it can be protected and that way it can heal. So it's not like the oh bad cholesterol. That's unfortunately something that doctors will call it because often those numbers are very high when there's a lot of inflammation in the system. Mm-hmm. When people have uh, you know higher cardiovascular issues, 
there, those numbers are higher. Well, why are they higher? Well, they're higher because more taxis are needed to get more cholesterol. More cholesterol is needed because there's more inflammation in the mm-hmm. cardiovascular system. Mm-hmm. So they're only doing their jobs. It's, <laughs> it's like, don't shoot the messenger. It's So this is something that that's its job. But what we're doing is we're saying, okay, how good are those taxis though? How efficient are they in in being made and doing their jobs? So uh, I had noticed, I believe somewhere in there, someone had asked about the different numbers um, for APOE. Now, APOE is different the way that it is read than other genes, because other genes you'll see in A, T, C, or G, or the four nucleotides that make up DNA, and that they're usually a double letter. Well, in this, you'll actually see two numbers. And the reason why is because there's actually, uh, when we're looking at the chromosome, there's actually different sections. There's an ApoE2, ApoE3, ApoE4. And there's two different variations that we're looking at. So we look to see on which uh, section, ApoE2, 3, or 4 it is. So depending on where that variation is, you'll get the numbers. So for example, um, the 2-2 gene um, is actually very rare. And this is something that actually I have had one client that I've ever seen have this and where there is this genetic disorder that it is associated with um, called hyperlipoproteinemia. Oh, good job. Um, That's a mouthful. Yes. Good job. (laughs) But like I said, out of like uh, hundreds of people that I have seen through DNA, I've only had one person with that particular Mm -hmm. bird. Oftentimes three is the most common that I have seen. And this is a normal version. Like I said, it is the most common. And this is often associated with normal cholesterol management and function. Mm -hmm. Um, Two, three, that actually is an optimal version. I do have a handful of clients. Yeah, yeah. It's also rare. So for those who are frantically looking up their results, (laughs) a majority, if not all of you, will not be two, three but it is the ideal form, right? So I, the one way you can think about it kind of with these numbers is the lower the number to an extent, the better, because it just means you're better at kind of packaging up and creating these taxis, right? There is a difference between HDL and LDL, really how well you've created or made your taxi, right? You can kind of think about the HDLs as kind of the Rolls Royces on the road, and maybe the the LDLs is, uh, I don't know, I don't want to disparage a car company or betray that I don't know much about cars, maybe the Honda Civics, I don't know, are those still... I don't know, whatever. Think about the expensive car compared to the not so expensive car. (laughs) And then once you kind of get up to the four, it's kind of that, it's kind of that car where you're praying it starts at the beginning of the day. (laughs) Exactly. You know, to be able to pick up the cargo and bring it, that's, that's the important thing. Um, But you will see if you have a four, like Dr. Krista was saying, when you start getting into those higher numbers, you know, this is where you can have some issues. And I do have a lot of people that are three, four. Now this gets mm-hmm. into that less optimal profile, you know, where they're, the way that this would show up is that you may have more chronically high cholesterol numbers uh, on your markers when you do your blood work, higher LDL levels, even if you are eating healthy, exercising, doing yeah. all of this. Um, yeah. it, again, this is a genetic predisposition that will tend to show up in that way. Yeah. So that's really the gist of the APOE. I think you very elegantly, beautifully described the cardiovascular impact of APOE. Let's spend just a brief moment on the side of things that predispose towards dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera, right? Because I think we'll see a lot of people and one of the very few genes that they've heard about, again, through the news media is APOE and they'll say like, oh, I know four is bad. If I have a four, it means I'm going to get, and let's demystify that a little bit because there are a lot of people walking around where they do not have an APOE4 and they have Alzheimer's 
And the flip of that, there are a lot of people walking around with a four that do not have Alzheimer's, right? It's it's not fatalistic. So let's talk about a first. Let's say that it's not fatalistic if you have an APOE4. Does mean you have to live a little bit differently. But what would you do? So let's pretend you have an APOE4. What do you do in prevention of? What do you need to be mindful of in prevention? And I think this will call up a few of our other more favorite genes as well. <laughs> yes. Well, one of the first things that you do is look at your diet. This is something the that, hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because really what we want to do is we want to not have uh, the need for the taxis. So if you don't have the inflammation or if you have very little of it, well, then we don't need a whole fleet of taxis grabbing the cholesterol. We may only need a few. And then, you know, we can kind of help with that. So a lot of it, you have to think of prevention. Mm -hmm. So in prevention, let's lower the toxic load. And this is why I had mentioned about the detoxification pathways and, you know, your glutathione conjugation pathway, because that mm. really is very helpful in the cardiovascular system. So really, let's let's lower the need to have the taxis in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's something I would look at. And, and as I said, with your food. Well, there's there can be a lot of toxins and uh, inflammation with certain foods when you're talking about processed foods and high omega six seed oils and fried foods or foods that are um, like meats, proteins when they're cooked at very high heat and they're charred and and you are introducing a lot of toxins. A client of mine, beautiful phrase, control the controllables. <laughs> I love that. Control the controllables. You can control what is on the end of your fork. Mm -hmm. You can control what you put into your body and on your body. Mm -hmm. So that right there. If I might, I would also yeah. offer to, but don't let the controllables control you too. I think we all need to, to be gracious and acknowledge that every once in a while, it's really good and healthy to have certain indulgences, right? Mm -hmm. We're not telling the alcoholic to go have an occasional drink, but we are saying that, you know, in order to live a good life, right? We look at blue zone areas. So for people's edification, when we talk about blue zone, we're talking about areas of the world where people live with into their hundreds, but the qualifier here, they live happily and healthily into their 100s, right? These aren't people kind of sitting on the bed, you know, praying for another day. These are people who are still up and active, right? And in almost all of those cultures, vices, so be that a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of staying out too late, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, all of those things are within those cultures, they are just not things that are the focal point and an everyday thing. So I like the control the controllables, but don't let the controllables control you either because you want to be happy and joyful in the time that you're living. And the thing is, when you live for the majority of the time, a good, healthy life, lifestyle, getting a good sleep, good food, it provides you more of wiggle room <laughs> to... Yeah indulge every once in a while in these things and not have it affect you so profoundly you are able to recover much more quickly much more mm. readily, you know as far as and much more fully so it's it is truly finding that balance of living that good healthy life but also enjoying it you know, at certain times. Mm -hmm. that's the key. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, so how would you fold in? So with this awareness that APOE can predispose a little bit to Alzheimer's, right? And we, we're starting to call Alzheimer's, you know, diabetes type three, how would you fold something like T TCF 7L2 into this? So why don't you talk about what that gene is and how you would fold that into kind of the larger understanding that we've established so far? Okay. So uh, talking about TCF7L2, this is a protein that works with insulin uh, and its ability to do its job um, and whether you could be more susceptible to insulin resistance. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, insulin. The job of insulin is to open the door to a cell and let glucose in. 
Mm-hmm. That is sugar. Yes, that is a sensitive TCF seven L two insulin protein. Mm-hmm. It's he is sensitive to the glucose and says, hey, come on in. Let's get you in the cell. Let's get that cell some energy mm-hmm. because glucose is very necessary to make ATP, the mm-hmm. energy currency of the cell. There's a lot of things that the cell needs it for, but it has to get in there. Mm-hmm. Now, when you have insulin insensitivity, this means that he's not going to be open up the door for the glucose. It ends up staying in the blood. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you get your blood work, even fasting, you know, it can be 90s, 100, you know, 110, 120, Mm -hmm. you know, even higher. And that's because the sugar, that glucose is staying in the bloodstream instead of getting into the cells where it's needed. Yeah. So that's really the basis of of the job of it. Yeah. And I think the unintended consequence of that. And so if the sugar is just hanging out in the blood, I mean, this is a cross metaphor, but sugar is sticky, right? And so it's just, if you have too much, it's just going to stick to places. And we all know that when you have sugar on a counter that stick in there, you're going to attract unsavory things. You're going to be attracting ants and you're going to attract all the dirt that's just going to stick there, right? And so when you have too much sugar going around in your body in a long-standing way, it effectively sticks within the body and create some gunk, create some inflammation. And so in particular, what we're seeing is it will stick around in the brain a little bit too long. It'll clog things up and then lend to the more complicated and increased picture of cognitive decline of Alzheimer's, kind of all of these unsavory things that that we hear about in older age that we're all, I think, seeking to to um, mitigate, right? So TCF7L2 is kind of one of the ways that you'll have insight into, are you someone that needs to be more vigilant around blood sugars, right? The person who really truly only gets to have it as a treat, as opposed to someone who might have a bit more flexibility, right? Like when I think of genes and leveraging your genes for a personalized longevity plan, right? The goal, at least for me, I'll be very plain, is to be as lazy as possible. I'm very lazy when it comes to my health. I try to do the smallest things that give me the best outcome. So if you have really great TCF7L2 genes, it's not saying you get permission to eat all the sugar. It's saying maybe you focus your health energy elsewhere. You still have to be mindful of your sugar intake but there might be other low hanging fruit. That's, that's a better thought for you. Do you agree with that, Laura? Are you oh, lazy when it comes to your own healthcare? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I have to admit, I don't like going to a gym. I do. Oh. <laughs> I've been really oh. good. Actually. I want to know how you've been doing going to the gym. Cause I have been going to the gym. I don't really like it, but I go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> but, but even then, uh, I I want to get the most out of the shortest amount of time possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, I don't want to be spending, you know, two hours, you know, running on a treadmill and, and lifting weights and doing that if I can do something in 15 minutes and, yeah. you know, you know, benefit my body. So there are other things that I want to do, like learning more and helping more people out there learn about their health. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. And how I'm I'm curious because because I again I hope I hope we're not jumping around from topic to topic too much, but part of my goal is to kind of address all the genes that we've spoken about so far. And and one that we haven't spoken to directly yet is going to be uh 9P21. So I wonder, first of all, before you detail what 9P21 is, maybe you detail how 9P21 informs the type of exercise that you're doing, because mobility is something we need to be mindful of. And we know categorically, the more you move, the more you're working out, the more you're using your body, the better it is for health outcomes. But how do you leverage your DNA to know what exercise is best for you and how to how to be lazy about your exercise? <laughs> Well, uh, when you're looking at your 9P21 gene, you will see that there's a number and the letter G. Mm-hmm. And because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I, the way I tell people, it's not a, a typical SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism we're looking at. It actually is a chromosome locus. It's a section of that chromosome. And we're looking at three spots on it. Correct. So really it's, what I tell people is that it's like driving down a street 
Um, and because we have two chromosomes, we have two parallel streets we're driving down. And so the three spots we're looking at, it's like you're looking at three houses on each street. And I say, okay, of those three houses, so six total, we want to find out if those houses have black shutters, if they have G alleles. Because if they do, that means that the house can burn down more readily. You can become inflamed more easily in the presence of toxins. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when you're counting those houses to see how many have black shutters, Mm -hmm. or there are with black shutters, the more sensitive you are for inflammation. So therefore, you can have anywhere from zero to six Gs for your 9P21. So mm -hmm. if you have zero Gs, that's like stainless steel. It You do not become inflamed very easily at all. That's wonderful for you because oxygen can create mm -hmm. oxidants and cause inflammation in the cardiovascular system. And what do we get a lot of when we are doing cardiovascular exercises, a lot of oxygen, but also creating a lot of oxidants. And there are other uh, toxins that are present and that come through metabolism. Mm. So the lower the number, the more cardiovascular exercise you can handle. So if you have like a zero, one or two, yeah, you could probably do marathon running and, you know, actually, mm -hmm. you know, overall do pretty well. I mean, obviously there are other genes involved and I'm not going to throw it just on one gene. So I will say that, but generally that is one of the major ones that we look at for that. If you are someone like me who has <laughs> five houses with black shutters, okay, I become inflamed much more readily. Yeah. yeah um, marathon running is not my friend. Um, I actually always liked sprints, short bursts, and I am much better at uh, weight bearing exercises, weight resistant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the things that you can look at in your genes to determine, to help you determine mm -hmm. the type of exercise regimen that you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would offer too, because I, I think we see, at least I see within my consults, a lot of people who are high performers, be that in the corporate space or in the athletic space. And, and I always keep in mind this, I had a fellow once who across the board, both from his 9P21 and then separately detox and kind of all the other genes, he was the sort of person that, you know, should, should not go outside, you know, just didn't have great detox, didn't have great um, cardiovascular capacity. And yet he was a marathon runner and he was um, someone who was competitive in the bodybuilding space. Like he was kind of doing all the things. And when I was talking with him, what we really learned about him was he was totally aware he was more sensitive to things, but he was doing very things very proactively to mitigate that because his passion was running and bodybuilding. So he didn't let that stop him, but he put a lot of energy and effort into the recovery, into balancing the genes there, right? And again, I think, again, as we think about right? As we think about how do we form up our longevity plan, it's really ensuring we are not beholden exclusively to our genes, more that we understand them and then act accordingly based on what we want, based on that why that we talked about at the top of the hour. Why? What are you doing with your health? What are you enjoying with your health? Yeah. It's yeah. really leveraging the information, the yeah. knowledge. Mm -hmm. you know, here you are being given you know, a hand of cards, but in order for you to yeah. play them, first of all, you have to know the game. You have to know the rules yeah. to, be able to play that game. And yeah. it seems like that the client you were working with, not only did he know his hand well, but he knew how to play the game. Yeah. He knew really how to leverage that information to work it in his best interest. So he could do what brings joy to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. And so if nothing else, as we close up our time, you're inspired maybe to consider some of your sleep habits and to start shifting some, some things within your world, be it diet, um, be it sleep, 
be it exercise, some some beautiful little things that hopefully will beget better longevity. Um, I want to take a moment just to thank Dr. Lara for offering your time and insight and guidance here. We're so grateful to have you consulting with our clients here at the DNA Company. And I'm very grateful, given I last minute jumped into this, your forethought about what should be considered this evening as we talk about how do we not only live, you know, in a longer way, but in a more meaningful and healthy and happy way. So thank you so very much. Any any closing thoughts before, before we bid our audience adieu? Uh, first of all, I would like to say again, thank you everyone for being here, for taking the time out to continue to learn about genes, about yourself, about the things you can do to be healthier. That is wonderful. Taking that step, putting forth the effort and the energy is absolutely fantastic. And I applaud each and every one of you. So thank you. And Dr. Krista, thank you very much for being here and helping host this. You are always such a delight. And with wonderful information, I mean, we could just talk for hours and hours, <laughs> being, you know, exploring all of these different things. But this is why we do as many webinars as we do in the podcasts. And I do encourage you, everyone, you know, to look back and, and get some insight on some of the other wonderful information that we have mm -hmm. uh, talked about. So outside of that, I would say on the when it comes to longevity know your why mm. what what gives you mm -hmm. that spark that tingle in your body mm -hmm. that wants that helps you to push through the times that you just want to pull the covers back over your head hit the snooze and go I don't want to move <laughs> <laughs> that instead goes you know what even though I don't want to move I'm going to, I'm going to get up. I am going to exercise. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to breathe. I am going to find joy and gratefulness in my day because of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I find that. your joy. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that so very much. And, and I think on that beautiful note, the note of finding the why behind why you offer energy and effort to your health, that is where we will, we will leave everyone. So thank you for joining us. And we will see you a different bat time, a bit different bat night for the Adam West fans out there. I applaud you. For the non-Adam West fans, we'll see you at a different time and space. We'll see you guys later. Au revoir.